hello, Katakan. I'd like to welcome you to the sixth annual Kata Geek Meetup that has a long tradition dating back to the very first one. Here's a picture. How many of you are in this picture going back to uh, Miami? Yep, there's a few of you. Uh, here's what's going to happen over the next uh, couple hours. So we have seven Kata Geeks lined up to come up and share what they're working on or learning. After each presentation, there will be a time for open conversation and questions. Uh, most importantly, this is a relaxed atmosphere. Uh, we want, it's an open format. We want you to contribute to the conversation. So that means if you have a question of the presenter that was up here, ask it. If you have something to add to it, some insights or some experience maybe that you've had, Add to it. So we're going to walk around with microphones just so we can hear each other. So please, uh, by all means, contribute. When we're done, we're going to take the annual Kata Geek photo. And we're going to do that in the back of the room here with the help of our photographer in her extended pole there on the camera. Um, so we'll do that uh, Kata Geek photo and we will end by 6 p.m., okay? So that's the plan. So first up, uh, we, here's, here's our lineup as it stands right now. We're gonna start off with uh, Dorsey, go to Hugh, Tracy, Tilo, our friend Panos, Michael, and Sylvain. We're gonna start off with Dorsey. Dorsey, come on up. Please welcome Dorsey Sherman. <laughs> So I've heard the word coach a lot lately. Um, at my kid's school in Michigan, the intermediate school district offers coaches for teachers that are learning new curriculum. And um, my plumber has a ride-along coach that comes with him on service calls. Um, bosses say they are coaching poor performers. And of course, there are lean coaches and Kata coaches, life coaches, and I was wondering, are we all talking about the same thing? I don't think so. Um, all coaching is not the same, and um, it's not about right or wrong, but what I think varies is the intention. So that's what I'm going to give some examples on how the word is used in different ways, um, the same way with different intentions. So here's six examples. So tell, I put tell under a coaching definition because people say they are coaching when they're conveying information, they're educating, they're addressing inappropriate behavior, they're dealing with a safety concern as a lean coach. Um, I thought my job was to transfer the knowledge in my head about how our process should be improved, um, how to do an A3 correctly. I was telling the other person how to do it and in some cases just doing it for them because it was easier and faster. Um, feedback, giving a person feedback on their performance is also called coaching. You might hear this phrase, ooh, he really needs some coaching. Or I need to coach him on how to ask questions more effectively. In this context, the feedback is focused on weaknesses. Similar to telling, it's a no vote transfer of knowledge. When feedback, but can also be given in a way that's collaborative and problem solving and can look different. Mentoring is called coaching. The mentor is giving advice. They're usually more senior, more experienced, consists of stating what to do and how to do it. The mentor knows more, knows things that the mentee does not, which might not always be a safe assumption in a complex and changing work environment. Coaching for compliance means you're really trying to get the other person to do what you want them to do. The coach drills down to the problem, offers advice and solutions. The focus is on the problem or a discrete outcome, not the person. It can be effective in helping someone achieve a predetermined goal, but it can also trigger a stress response that hinders rather than helps progress. Coaching for compliance means you're looking to improve performance according to a specific organizational requirements. The problem is 
that fixing people usually doesn't work. Coaching for skill development. So these are our music teachers, our athletic coaches, our kata coaches, coaches that are looking for performance in a specific domain. Of course, in the coaching kata, we want learners to make a connection between process and outcome, looking for a focus on facts and data. And over time, we want learners to internalize that four-step improvement kata pattern. Coaching for compassion. This was coined by researchers at Case Western University. And the goal is to inspire and draw out the answer from someone else, help someone find their own way. To coach with compassion is to demonstrate interest in another person, convey empathy, communicate your desire to help, let them do 80% of the talking. The coach is focused on um, unlocking human potential. People say, well, isn't that therapy? My answer would be no. In the language of Toyota Kata, the coachee is setting their own challenge. The coachee is understanding their own direction. And the coach's job is not to teach the improvement kata pattern, but to enable the person to reach their goals. So I end with the question, what type of coaching are you doing? Thanks. So who, who has a question, a uh, comment? You want to add some insights? Just raise your hand, and I'll get a mic to you. All right, this feels weird saying this to Dorsey when she's sitting right next to me. So first of all, thank you. I think that's really helpful because we, we hear the word coaching a lot. I just um, recently completed a, a, a certified professional coach course. And one of the very important things that um, I learned in that course was the difference between um, coaching and therapy. And um, you have to be very careful, particularly when you're doing getting into that coaching with compassion, that you are not going in there with a therapeutic intent, you could actually get sued for practicing medicine without a license. So that distinction between, between coaching uh, with compassion and comp coaching or, or being a therapist, you've got to be very clear where that line is. So thanks. Just to add to that, the therapy comment is when you're doing repair of the past to help someone move forward, that's typically therapy. When you're coaching, helping someone get from where they're at to where they want to be, that falls under that definition more. So that's one way I look at it to make sure I'm not doing therapy, is to say, am I trying to, to help someone deal with the trauma of the past that they've had in their life or in their work or And, and when, I, when I move into therapy, I say, wait, we got to stop. We got we to focus on the outcomes we want to achieve rather than solving all the problems of the past. I just have a question related to coaching kata. When people are at a different level in the Dreyfus levels, do you see a different form of coaching occurring during those times? I mean, my experience would be you move from kind of of the slide I had, you move from telling, you know, as you're, I think the beginning of the Dreyfus is awareness. You move from telling to focusing on the problem to focusing on the person. Focusing on, uh, Mike has a slide where the initial coaching cut of the learner is hidden behind the card and you can't see them. And then as you become a more experienced coach, the card is behind the learner. The question, the learner comes out in front. It's about them and their development. <laughs> that would be. Yeah, I think we had coaches or managers say to us, there's a learner here. <laughs> I'm just trying to focus on this card, you know, that kind of thing. Um, just a quick question. There's a lot of discussion about um, moving, uh, empowering people, moving uh, decision making down in organizations because the people closer to the action. Uh, have better information and, and, and can make better decisions. It's more agile, if you will. Um, but that that, thank you, that that needs to be combined with managers, supervisors, and team leaders operating more as teachers or coaches to teach the people in their team how to navigate. That 
that kind of teaching or coaching is, uh, in a way, a prerequisite for empowerment. And I just wonder, anyone really out there, to what extent are you finding interest among not the lean people, but managers, supervisors, and team leaders in upping their skills in the coaching area so that they can you know, build up their team's capability and then use that capability to achieve all sorts of things. Are you finding more interest in that? Are you finding less interest in that? People talk about it and write about it, but I'm not sure what's actually happening on the ground. Anybody have anything to add there? So I, I do see uh, a lot of interest in, <coughs> can you hear? Sorry. Yes. Uh, there, I, I do see, Mike, a lot of interest in uh, people. We don't hire people coming in the door with all the skills. We, even if we did, the, the, the products change, the business changes. And so uh, I think there's a lot of thirst uh, for that among supervisors because the, everybody, everybody is overwhelmed. Uh, coming back to the, the, the thing about therapeutic, though, um, there's also a thirst for that. There is a thirst in the workforce. People are looking for therapy. And whether we're looking for them to come to us for it or not, they come to us for that sometimes. And so um, you're going to be confronted with that. We're going to be confronted with that, whether we want to be or not. And so that is something that uh, may be an interesting conversation for the coaches, uh, other than just saying, I'm not a therapist or I don't want to get sued. We need a better answer than that. So We've been driving that. We're a small organization. We've been driving the decisions as close to the process as we can. So it's our team leads that have gotten kata coaching, and they've been kata coaching um, the, our production team members, the operators actually doing the work. Um, and we were a host site for the AME conference in Chicago this year, and I was really surprised. We got a lot of positive feedback, but the AME conference says, what are three things that you will take back with you? And a couple of them said, allow operators to make decisions. So what was surprising to me was that that wasn't a goal and, and that to drive it as close, it just, it just surprised me because I thought that's, to me that's what lean was, is, and um, it, it, it struck me. So I think there's interest in it. I don't think people think you can actually do it. And I think that's a trust thing that you don't trust that the guy coming off the street, the operator doing the job every day, really is there for their brain. So I think that's, to me, what the disconnect must be, because all these organizations were driving that. They thought, but that they realized they actually could do it. It's possible. I would say to answer Mike's question, my experience has been I, I just did a workshop kind of teaching about leaders as coaches and taking more of a coaching role as a leader. And what they all wanted to know or the feedback I got from the class was, OK, that's all fine. But what do I do if this person is a problem? How do I fix that person? <laughs> and I was like, wait, no, that wasn't the, you know, that's not what we were, we were talking about developing people. And it's like, yeah, but how do I coach them when they're a problem, but they don't know they're a problem? It's like, well, that's not really what we're, but anyway, so I didn't, it's the opposite kind of of what you're saying is, is what I experienced just recently. But. And I guess what I'm asking is to what, extent do you, to what extent do we find managers, supervisors, and team leaders interested in changing their skill set or developing those skills? because they either feel pressure to do that or they want to do that. They, they want to empower their team. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious if the demand is there. I think the agile, if you will, press talks about that a lot. Um, but I just wonder how much it's actually happening. I feel funny using a microphone to answer your question. <laughs> um, so from my perspective in the MEP Center, I'm seeing a lot more interest with the clients that I work with to get um, more help around the people skills, listening, coaching, um, as the foundation for actually driving lean and cotton and all. And so in my, what I've seen is there's a lot of interest there. Okay. Hi, I'm Shane, and I'm in the software world, so this is something we deal with. And it, there is strong interest, partially because of measurement. So we measure 
net promoter score of employees. And if it's low, the real thought is there's failures of leadership in order that, that that's a cause and effect, that poor leadership causes disengagement, which will then lead to a more trailing indicator of employee net promoter score. So there's a lot of interest because some of the managers are getting questions about, wow, you have a very low score here, sir or ma'am. Uh, what are you going to do about it? So, you know, some of it is how do we make that transparent that their leadership is not where it needs to be and they have some grace. So uh, part of the organization went through uh, the multipliers book, which describes various kinds of leadership behaviors and diminisher behaviors. Which behaviors are you having, you know, that could cause this degradation in engagement? And for a lot of our workforce, they're knowledge workers. So they tend to react badly to poor leadership and then vote with their feet and that kind of stuff. So I have had an experience over the last two years. I don't really need a microphone, but I'll use it for you guys. <laughs> two years, 40 team members went through a two-day coaching session with an intensive 90-day effort afterward. Observing the performance of the group of 40, 30 of them successfully passed the 90-day program. And as I was engaging that consultancy, they shared those were the similar results they've seen in other sectors, and they range from healthcare to manufacturing to other services. That wasn't the surprising data point, which I think is what Mike is asking about. And that is, as soon as the 90-day coaching cycle ended and there was an intensive overview, Less than 10%, 15%, that's, a, that's the people I saw stick with it. So <clears throat> my experience is about 10 to 15% of the workforce will stick with the program of coaching. A second question that was asked earlier, I think there is a desire for some people to be coaches, but an ignorance to what coaching is, as Dorsey had mentioned. So I think it's an, a responsibility of certain leaders to go and say, what is coaching? What is feed forward versus feedback, therapeutic versus, I would say, effective coaching? So it's not as, I would say, hopeful as I thought it might be, because it just seems like people drop off and that's not the reward in the system. And a lot of people just, at least in my organization, take it as a job and they go home just like a lot of other organizations. Okay, would you help me thank Dorsey? <laughs> and next up we have our friend Hugh Alley. So please welcome Hugh. Thanks. Um, so uh, what I want to do uh, is talk to you about a client that I've been working with, um, tell you a little bit about the challenge, and pose a question because it's something I've been experimenting a bit with this client, and I don't know the answer, but it's been really interesting. So the challenge that they have, that, they, that we agreed was the challenge, uh, is that they needed a 75% reduction, about $750,000 a year, uh, in their rework and remake uh, by April 30th this year. We had a six-month window to do that. And the current condition is that they were running about a million dollars a year in rework, uh, and it had caught their attention because it was up from half a million uh, six months earlier. Uh, they were running 330-odd NCRs uh, in October um, and very limited lean or kata experience anywhere in the company. Uh, most of the uh, leads, supervisors had grown up in the organization. They didn't have any experience with, from other places. And the target condition we set for ourselves was that we wanted the rework down at under 250,000 a year, but we also need it, wanted to have the leadership with a daily habit of continuous improvement, and we wanted some useful plant performance measures in place uh, and kept current. That was our situation. And, oh, back up. Um, the strategy that we took uh, is 
a bit at variance with the recommended model. Uh, we just started widely. Um, so we ran 13 storyboards in each lead had one. We taught as needed. Uh, and we were not picky about the condition of the storyboards. Um, it, we were looking at more, let's just get these people starting to ask questions, to look at data, uh, and then try to make some improvement. And so what was really interesting is that most of the leads uh, on their first target condition, uh, on their focus processes, would get a 60 to 100 percent reduction in their uh, in, in their rework and remaking. Um, so fabulous outcomes, but not everywhere. Uh, and so you can see a, uh, the graph on the left, upper left, is one is the paint line. Their NCRs per week went it dropped very nicely, uh, but the NCRs at the CNC area, that's the lower right, uh, dropped and then rose again, um, and you see an overall situation in the graph on the left, on on the right, where. Uh, the numbers went up initially because for the first time people were actually paying attention and, and actually counting what was going on and they've started to come down. So we've got a, an inconsistent outcome. And I have a clicker that is not doing quite what I need. There. So here are two storyboards, gives you an idea of the mixed quality. Uh, the, the storyboard on the left there, uh, remarkably good. Um, and uh, I, I was really fortunate, uh, had uh, friends Hal and Tracy come down and visit and Tracy's comment was that this storyboard was uh, on the left was what you'd expect for some, somebody that's been doing it for a year. This was two months in. And then the storyboard on the right, which was pretty sketchy, um, uh, is, was more typical of what we were seeing. Um, and as, thing, as, as we've proceeded with the project, we've got stickier and stickier about, so is that really complete? Is the objective well stated? Is the target condition well stated? And all that kind of thing. So just in starting to insist on uh, the quality that, that you might normally think about. And there are pros and cons of insisting on good storyboards from the start. Uh, the, the, the value of it is that you get good habits from the outset that you don't have to fix later. And, and it really matches the TWI principle of correcting people from the start. You know, you don't let them do bad work. Um, the con of it, and this was part of what, why we chose uh, to go the route we did, is that the, the startup cycle, the learning cycle at the early stages, uh, it's hard for the learner to see the whole process. Um, which will make it a longer time to see, to get results and to get excited. And so we just kind of said, we're going to try this and see what we get. And the question that I have is, should we do that? Should we insist on good storyboards from the start? Or is it worth sometimes just throwing them into the fire and letting them struggle with it and letting them learn that the storyboards aren't adequate for them to really uh, work out the scientific method. Uh, or scient and, and, and so that's my question to you because I don't have the right answer. Question about your question. Did you have to start at 13 places at once and if so or why and unpack that a little bit? Um, the, the question was, do I, did we have to start at 13 places at once? Um, we made the decision that every lead was going to run a storyboard. So it was, it was, that, it was an ar as arbitrary as that. 
I'm just saying we weren't going to pick one area rather than another. Um, I, uh, he asked, do, what do I think about it now? I'm actually pretty happy with what I'm seeing. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raghavan. Uh, it's good to meet you all here. Uh, so this is my input on the question. I think it uses another TWI, JR principle. You should treat each person as an individual. So it depends on how receptive uh, he or she as the learner is uh, to course correcting. Because when I first started at Normac five years ago, I'm going to have my coach right here, and she would really insist on the quality of a good storyboard. And I think that is good practice. And uh, even though I don't consider myself very acceptive um, of you know, course correcting, I think it's still ingrained in me those good habits. But once I became a coach and I was coaching a, a line operator on putting together a storyboard, one of the line operators said, Raghavan, this is frustrating. You know, you're course correcting so much that I don't want to really do it. So I went back, I thought about it, and then I said, what is my objective here? My objective is to develop this person to be a scientific thinker, but if he or she is frustrated, then the Kata Handbook says the job of the coach is to not make the learner frustrated, and how can I not do that is to not overly course correct. And I said, you know what? It's fine. You know, I'm going to let that part slide. I'll, I'll just focus on one little thing about the storyboard at a time, not the entire thing. So that's what I did. I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, but I would say it depends on the individual. Thank you. I'll give my two cents worth. Oh. Yeah. I kind of agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, it's the, on the individual, and I guess the principle here is you're trying to change a habit, and you're trying to establish a habit which is actually immensely complex. The scientific thinking habit within this structure, there's a lot of moving parts to it. So sometimes if something's overwhelming, reduce the scope. But what I would say, Hugh, is insist on the storyboard being good from the start. Maybe not, but insist on something being perfect from the start and work on that, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. And if you don't know where to begin, it's in grasp the current condition, because that's what drives everything else. So um, especially with MEP centers, there's uh, a lot of incentive to make that big outcome metric move, right, and to reach that challenge. So there's a lot of focus on that, on that outcome metric. So what's your, what's your objective is the first thing. If it's that you're trying to help the company hit that number, then, you know, essentially getting more people involved. And I've had two companies that were almost the exact opposite in this regard. One company it was about getting involvement in the, the precision with which they practice kata was less important than getting engagement and getting wide involvement so that they could get people involved. And they made great strides. I've had another company that the focus was really on developing capability. That company is farther along, two years out, than the company that was focused on the objective you know, in, in getting people involved. But that was what that company needed culture. Now they're going back in course correcting and getting more specific about it. But in my opinion, it doesn't take that much more to one point at a time get to better kata practice, better storyboards. It's really not that much different as long as you're sensitive to what your learner needs. So always thinking, what does my learner, le le learner need? Always thinking, what is my objective here? Am I developing capability in an organization? Or am I just trying to move the outcome metric and reach a challenge? All right. Um, <clears throat> so here's my, my question back. What does this storyboard represent? Um, so the storyboard is, we hope, the uh, display of the scientific mind th mindset. Perfect. So whoever the individual might be, right, pretty much the storyboard is the MRI scan of their brain. Let's assume that, right? Now, we're all perfectly imperfect, so there's not going to be such a thing as good at the beginning. So if you have every individual is not going to be the same, we're going to all have different starting conditions. So you're going to be faced, and we're all going to be faced with different situations to begin with. So 
it's my opinion that we need to be patient because we're not developing the storyboard. We're developing the thinking in the individual so they can create the behavior that we want to see, which is intentional curiosity. So when we say good storyboard, we need to really try to understand what good is. And really in the minds of, instead of saying storyboard, it's really the mindset of the individual, right? The way they think. So I wouldn't get hung up how the storyboard looks from the get-go. Because I want to develop the learner, so the storyboard will, will be a reflection on their thinking. So as long as the storyboard evolves to what you have as a standard as a good storyboard, that means you're developing their thinking in that direction. But again, that's my opinion. Um, I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to encourage everyone who has the mic to stand up so those of us at the edges can see who it is who's talking down there. Um, so, Hugh, I was thinking, oh, and my name's Tracy, so I've been to this place. A uh, couple things. One, building on what Pano said, yes, the storyboards will show you the current condition of the learner, but from an instructional point of view, which is often my filter, and because I'm sitting next to someone who calls her consulting company Model, um, I'm thinking you didn't have a standard for anybody to know what a normal, what a complete and easy to read storyboard would look like. And you may remember that uh, over lunch I suggested to the bosses who were there that these storyboards would come up to their board and they should have a board. And then the, um, first of all, they'd be tracking the point. I'm wondering if you maybe could make a model board where all this is so you know the current top. Because if you don't have an idea, because they haven't seen the book, they haven't been anywhere, so they're kind of freelance jazzing the board, right? Like they don't know if they should have a run chart, should they be counting something. The one guy who has an, a board that I said, this is a great board, was a CNC operator. So he was kind of a bear for data, and he had a whole bunch of pretty easy, clear to read uh, quality and process and output metrics. So I'm thinking um, maybe, which I didn't explicitly tell you at the time, but maybe it's always a good strategy to have either the board that shows where all the other boards go, or your board that shows how you're doing teaching people, or something that is uh, at least has all the bits available to be understood. Great question for discussion. Maybe we should start having a qu everybody who presents at the Kata Geek meetup should end with a question to the group or something. So. Uh, yeah, very, very good. Uh, and jumping off of a couple of comments, Thanos, uh, I really enjoyed your comment too. Um, I remember my daughters when they were little would come up to me and they go, Daddy, how do you spell some word, right? And I would turn to them and say, how do you think you spell it? And it really pissed them off. Um, <laughs> you know, they're like, Dad, I just wanted, they just wanted to get it right on their paper or test or whatever they were doing, right? And until I knew where they were having difficulty, I couldn't give them a feedback like I before E except after C, those kinds of things, right? So I was interested in learning where are you now so that I can give you what you need to become a better speller or a better scientific thinker, whatever you're working on. They were just interested in getting the storyboard right uh, for class tomorrow. And it, I, I'm not sure that would ever go away. You know, Dad, you just don't understand. Uh, it's not till years later that they come back and they go, I understand why you said, how do you think you should spell it? Why don't you try spelling it? Play a few bars on the clarinet before I give you feedback as a music teacher. Kick the ball a few times before I can't give you feedback until I see where you are, that kind of thing. So awesome discussion. Okay, please help uh, me thank Hugh. Hugh, Hugh didn't mention this, but you actually have a book coming out sometime soon. What's the title of it? So the book is called Becoming the Supervisor, uh, Achieving the Company's Mission and Building Your Team. Uh, and it's coming out uh, from Productivity Press in May, we hope, uh, maybe June. Great. Okay, we are in the uh, Canadian portion of our lineup here. So we have Tracy Defoe up next. So please welcome Tracy. So I promised a really short one, so I don't expect a ton of questions or anything. I have one slide. This is my slide. Um, last year at Catacon, I told Mike that I really appreciated when I had a chance to talk to everybody about their practice. And he put me onto a website called Cata Europe. 
www.eu. And so I got, the, oh, where did it go? Oh, okay, I went the wrong way. Backwards. Yeah, one minute. I said one minute. That's my whole minute. Uh, so I registered the name catageek.com and I'm starting up a website where we can start to have conversations we don't have other places or where you can come and find perhaps someone who uh, will coach you for free because you're caddying in secret, which is my topic tomorrow, so you can't buy a coach. Um, and where we can list events and resources. Um, the Women in Lean group, which we mentioned before, which I'm a member of, is really great at saying, hey, I'm going to Austin. Do you want to meet up and have dinner or coffee? Let's meet in person. We've only met on LinkedIn, that kind of stuff. So catageek.com, you'll find out when it's up. Uh, inspired, like I said, by uh, Cata Europe, by the experiences we're having with uh, weekly phone calls on the people who went to the uh, coaching dojo in Seattle, uh, which we call the Cascadia Coaching Dojo, we, and also by you guys, the Cadigate community, who have taught me so much and uh, welcomed an education curriculum nerd into your ranks. So that's my minute. Questions, comments? <laughs> Thank you. Tilo Swartz. First question is because, Dwayne, you asked me to share a bit of what we learned with the Cata Dojo since 2019. So now my challenge was to know um, who will be here for the meetup and if the people that come would know the dojo. So what I did at home was, you know, I have this crystal ball and I just sat there and waited for the crystal ball to tell me who will show up. But somehow it doesn't work beyond the Atlantic. So anyways, um, so who knows what the Cata Dojo is? Anybody here? Okay, so good. So I can be quick on that first one. So um, just for those that don't know, um, here's a quick way to explain it. Pilots go to flight simulators to practice certain situations. Athletes go to the gym. Special forces go to like rebuilding the mission before they take the mission. So actually, the Cata Dojo is a setup, a safe space for coaches where they can practice their coaching skills without kind of being blamed by others or being in danger. So it works like this here, just, just quickly here. Uh, in the Dojo, we have a played improver, scripted improver, that kind of repeatedly simulates the same situation for the coach. And so the coach can then, with every approach, kind of hone his coaching skills. And I think that is very important because just by repeating the same situation over and over uh, in reality, we don't get better. Or in other words, just by reading the card and using the five questions, we won't get better unless we do it deliberately. So anyways, um, we've been using that for a couple of while now. And here's some interesting things we learned when using the Kata Coaching Dojo inside of companies. So the first thing we learned is that working as second coaches, feedback might not work as good as we think. Uh, put simple, if you give me feedback, um, although it might be super feedback and I understand it, if I don't get an opportunity to practice it, I won't get better. Which means, in actually, if, I give feed, if you give me feedback after a coaching cycle, I would need to have the same situation of a coaching cycle repeat tomorrow which is not going to happen, not to speak of repeating it like six times, 10 times, 12 times until it's in my muscle memory. So as a second coach, we, it might not be enough to give feedback. Um, second thing, we need a safe space for repeated practice. Uh, also, it seems like coaches kind of long for that. Like where is the space for manager or supervisors to practice without being like under result pressure, peer pressure, observed by everybody, by their team members? So that helps. Um, another thing we learned is that it's not only about asking questions. So here's, here's the thought. If we ask a question, how do we evaluate the answer? Because that's kind of kind of come up with the next reaction of the coach. Or in other words, we could all ask the same questions, which we basically do by reading from the card. However, the interesting part is what do we do with the answer? And your evaluation of the answer might be completely different from my evaluation. You might, I might say, well, this answer is good from my improver or learner. You might say, well, this is not a good answer. Your reaction will be different. If that happens in the same organization, people will be quite confused. They will say, well, you coach is that way, Tilo coaches that way. So I think we need to practice on building our reference. So where do coaches go? When do coaches see each other? So the dojo is also a place where 
a group of coaches can build their reference. Another thing we learned here, it's not the clicker that works, um, we don't have to do full coaching cycles to practice. We can go phase by phase. So think of that, like the, the, the coaching kata questions structured the conversation into five phases. And in the dojo, we don't need to run full cycles. We can practice phase by phase. That is very nice because five phases create high complexity. And with giving people the question card and asking them to, to kind of coach, we, they always have to go through all five phases in reality, which creates different situations. In the dojo, just do phase by phase and you, you build it stepwise, reduce complexity. Um, Another interesting thing is that the dojo kind of is built on understanding and training micro skills. So you kind of, if you ask yourself, what's good coaching? Well, good coaching consists of many different aspects. Find them, train them separately. In reality, you need them all in a combination. Situational, depending on the person, just like we heard in the dojo, you can do it separately. Another thing we found out is this. Um, like we all know that the five questions are not enough to manage every situation. They're just the starting point. So we need deepening questions. And I don't know about here in the US, but in Europe we had, at least amongst the trainers, we had a bit of a challenge for a while. Like who has the better card with the deepening questions? Like who has more, who has fancier ones, okay? Um, I think that's very complicated because then beginner coaches end up with two cards. One card with five questions, another card with 20 questions. So. And then, I don't know if you've seen that, they go like, they look at the card front side, ask the question, answer is not good, then they turn to the back side and kind of scan the 20 questions they have on the back side. And they go like, oh, I picked that one. I don't think that deepening questions work without understanding the intention behind the deepening questions. So actually, I think it would be better for us to, based on the micro skills we need for coaching, develop coaching concepts. And those of you that have been in the dojo, they know, for example, the repeat and add. That's a very powerful concept. We can go with the five questions a long way if we use repeat and add. So I'm just posing that. Let's reduce on deepening questions and increase on coaching concepts. All right. Um, last thing is sometimes we want to always do it all kind of, and we're not maybe humble or patient enough to practice these small tricks. We've seen that in the dojo as well. So I keep repeating the message, mastering, an individual skill comes before adding complexity, which also is something that the dojo allows us to do. So we can like make a coaching phase very simple and then we can increase complexity by building it together. All right, um, just three more points and then I'll be, I'll be done here, what did we learn? So more on the emotional side. What we found is that, I didn't expect that when I started with the dojo five years ago, that Coaches practicing in the dojo align their reference and their way of coaching. Um, that was interesting for me because working with coaches from the outside of a company, you look on the company, and even if you're an internal trainer or lean, somebody from the lean um, team or whatever you say in English here, um, you look on the organization and you say, well, we have 10 coaches, 15 coaches. And you think, wow, that's a critical mass. What we often forget is that they don't see each other in daily life. They're separate. So meeting in the dojo helps them to align. Um, we've also found that practicing in the dojo makes it easier for coaches to use the five questions, like especially if somebody is not so interested in that. They go like, oh, my peers are using that. Hmm, maybe not a bad idea, maybe I should that, do that too. And last but not least, it's lots of fun. It's a fun way to, to do. So here is what we kind of look at now for the future. So I think that thinking of the five questions as five phases makes for much wider application. And with the dojo, we can transfer the kata, coaching kata coaching model into other applications. I'll show you how that works here. So we basically know that the five questions are used in front of the storyboard, but of course that's not what we're looking for. I mean, we should be able to coach in any kind of situation. Of course, the dojo is good to practice these five questions. However, there might be an even better or 
bigger use for the dojo. And that is using the dojo to practice the five questions in completely different situations, not in front of a storyboard. And here's what we've seen develop from the dojo idea. So there's one of our colleagues in Sweden, and she works with a company that is very strong on A3. And she said, I don't want to introduce Kata as a separate thing in this company. So she took the Kata Dojo exercises, transferred them into a A3 format. And she brought the managers in to learn to coach on developing and implementing an A3. Of course, the five questions are in there, but they don't call it kata. They just practice how to coach on A3 in the dojo. Um, then I have another company, they do shop for management, like these level one, level two, level three meetings. Um, of course, it would be good to have the person moderating the meeting coach rather than giving advice. So they've reassembled their shop for meeting situations in the dojo and started practicing to coach them. Um, then there's a software company um, working with, with Agile in Europe, and they've started now to build a coaching dojo for Scrum Masters. Of course, the five questions are kind of underlying in there, but they try to transfer that. We could go even beyond and come up with dojos for certain roles. So here's what I mean. Um, so there's another team that that has asked the questions, what are situations in the daily life of a manager coaching would be useful? Let's transfer them to the dojo and practice how to coach them. Then there has been a teacher who has started working with the dojos for teacher-parent and teacher-kid conversation. Resemble these situations. And you know what? He just recently called me and said, well, I did a dojo today with one of the kids I work with. I go like, oh, how, how does that work? So he's, he's working with kids that have mental problems or I have um, got psychological difficulties. So he was with a, working with a kid that has high aggression. So if you poke him, he's going to hit you back. So he kind of took him to the analysis of that phase, saying, okay, what are the situations that kind of make you angry? They went through that. Then they developed some strategies how to solve that. And then he said, well, let's replay that in the dojo so you can practice. And I said, did that work? He said, yes, the kid left it. And then he said, and by the way, I have a colleague that is working with uh, young criminals, prison. Maybe we can do some dojo there. Would you be interested? So I think we, we really have an opportunity here for taking the five questions we're so used to, and we usually use in front of a storyboard, and bring them to a lot other areas and use them there. So, just if we have some time, my question would be, those of you that know what the dojo is, what have you, you experienced with the dojo since 2019? Maybe you can just give some quick flashlights or something like that. Thank you. Hello, hello everybody. It's Michael. Um, Tila, you said that the dojo is fun. Kind of like fun, like uh, running a marathon is fun, right? Exhausting and a little bit painful, but very, very meaningful. And I just wanted to say, for me, uh, I was, you know, five, six years into practicing kata, and I kind of grown a little bit stagnant, I think, in my progression as a coach. And then just one or two days with, with the dojo was transformative for me. It really was the, the biggest step for me forward in several years. So thank you for that. And, um, and I just uh, point out one thing that was a key insight for me. I didn't, maybe you captured it in your list of elements, but... Um, the when you're in a coaching kata dojo you're working on your coaching skills not on your improvement kata learner skills which is the tendency that we all want to do is like perfect the storyboard or or whatever and not focus on the soft communication skills of how you l help coach the person that was the part that was missing for me and it seems so obvious in hindsight but it was profound at the moment so uh, kudos to you for a great great workshop about the drive through oh yeah 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 so we did, when I did the training, it was like 10 hours, training the trainer on day one, and then we taught on day two, eight hours. And uh, that's great workshop format. It's transformative, amazing. But I really like the, uh, what I call the drive through dojo, where somebody, just an individual or two, will drop by the office if they've got 15 to 30 minutes. And in that time, you can typically run through one of the case studies. There's about 22 case studies in there, like scenarios, that correspond with the five coaching kata questions. And so... You can just do one in about half an hour, 
and you can do it more frequently, smaller batches. Um, and that's been powerful. And, you know, as long as, you know, there's a, there's a few little obstacles you have to work through in terms of orient orienting them to the scenarios very quickly. But other than that, it's pretty smooth. And I think that's kind of um, how we, we're progressing forward with katas, like in small doses with the dojo. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just to add to that, so the dojo we found is not a course you take. It's more like a gym. Like, imagine your organization having a gym for managers they can go to every week for an hour to practice their skill. You wouldn't go to the gym for two days every month, right? We don't do that. We go there every week for an hour. That's kind of the idea. So having that safe space where they can go and practice. Yeah, I was able to see this. Uh, dojo last year uh, came at the at Catacon. Uh, I was able to come out here and see Tilo, and uh, we went through the two day kata dojo that you were just talking about. There's been a lot of work that we've been able to do in our organization, even going back to uh, Hughes slides. They're talking about uh, the, the storyboard and how perfect we need the storyboard to be. Understanding the phases and starting off with mastery of each phase before you move on to the next phase really helps the learner to understand where they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to be doing. It's very difficult for a learner to understand how to build a target condition if they don't understand their current condition. And that was one of the things that we got hung up on was trying to build the storyboard without clearly understanding current condition and all the rest of it. And the learners were getting frustrated because they were skipping past some of the some of the mastery of the f first phases. So just understanding this, this way of thinking about the phases and, and making sure that we've got phase one down before we move on to phase two has really helped our learners to own it and even to be able to add new learners into our model without going through a whole lot of in-depth teaching about what kata is and going through the whole, you know, so, sometimes we do a two, to, two or three days camp where get them caught up on our, st or start starting on a storyboard. We don't have to do that because all we have to do is just ask them those first questions. And if, we, and if we don't know the answer to phase one or if we don't understand the current condition, that's okay. What's something you can do to find out? So, Tilo, I did a little bit of a variation on the Kata Dojo, but using the thinking and the concepts of that uh, to help uh, give a colleague more coaching reps as before they went out and coached in the field. So I'm always working on something that has Kata thinking in it. So I just expressed myself and built a storyboard and had her coach, uh, and I was the learner, but I would intentionally drop things off the storyboard or as I was giving her answers, build in those very those things that you would build into a scenario, but do it on the fly every every day and throw in different things, and then second coach her after she was done coaching. So there's an opportunity to make it live as well when you're doing that if you are acting as the learner. To add to that, Scott, it's also we found the dojo is a very cool tool for the second coach. That's what you just explained, you know? So rather than giving feedback, you say, okay, I think I understand the pattern you're struggling with. Let's resemble that in a dojo exercise. Okay, thank you, Tilo. <laughs> and next up, we have uh, Panos Efsta. Panos? All right. Good afternoon, y'all. All right, so um, I want to hope that I want to inspire you today uh, and influence your thinking as you go uh, in the next couple of days. And I want to inspire you primarily through my failures, right? not just my successes. So I want to talk to you a little bit about intentional curiosity. So uh, a lot of things have happened to me the last year where I've developed my competency uh, very rapidly, really by looking at what I knew and what I didn't know. So, um, uh, for those of you that uh, like uh, Matrix, right? Uh, <laughs> I want you to take this uh, as, uh, as a starting point to the question I'm gonna throw to you at the end of this uh, uh, conversation. So, uh, one thing that is uh, certain is that uh, we're talking about kata, routine, and we're looking at changing our behavior in the process. So it has a psychological impact, right? 
So how do we build that thinking? And uh, it's interesting, there was uh, an Oxford uh, University research, and um, in really, as adults, right, we're observing our environment, and we're getting influenced by that. As kids, we tend to have more curiosity, right? I used to play with Legos all the time, and I never read the manual. I was just putting them together, and I was trying to figure out the end result. But I was curious, you know, we'll fail, and I will not have a problem to remove the blocks and try it again. As adults, we have gotten away from it. So we are addicted to facts, no doubt about it. I don't think there's any, uh, uh, any of us here that doesn't look at data. And, and data is a very, uh, inside, it gives us some insightful information. But one thing is certain, it's the context behind the data that matters, not the data points in themselves, right? So we don't necessarily just need facts. We need more curiosity. And my friend Deandra there, she had made a post that it was Mike's forward on, from Twitter that you know, we need, you know, we have facts and curiosity, but we need more curiosity. So what I want us uh, to start thinking about it is, how do we build intentional curiosity? Not just arbitrary thinking, but it being intentional of the things that we do and the way that we think. So uh, let, let's uh, imagine this, right? We're doing the work and we're improving the work in our daily lives. And majority of the time, I want to think that we're doing the work. But here is the problem. What happens if you hit the screwdriver with a hammer? What do you think is going to happen, right? So let's look at this example. Now, uh, if you're in Texas, you know, it's a little bit different. So, so let's picture this example, right? So let's assume that the screwdriver there is the learner, right? And this is us, and we have the brick wall to go through. That's our everyday life. So what do you think is going to happen uh, if we keep hammering that specific screwdriver? Any ideas? It will break, right? We're going to break the handle. We're going to uh, mess up the tip. And we're going to make the screwdriver unusable. Right? We're going to throw it to the side. So how many of us have felt like this in the past or have made people feel like this in the past? We have put the wrong people at the wrong roles, right? And we keep on hammering, but uh, we have not developed them. So uh, what if, uh, in that case, right, what we do is we blame the system, right? Uh, Kata doesn't work for us. We're too unique for this. Uh, or we don't have management support. I mean, uh, I cannot tell you enough how many times I've heard the, the phrase management support. But is it truly management support that we're lacking? So what about building the necessary skill at the beginning and every day? Rather than just focusing on the process, what if we focus on the learner? So and a concept that I derived, at least in the last uh, few years, so I've been practicing uh, kata since 2009, uh, when my company at that point, Modin, was influenced by Mike's uh, research. So we started practicing uh, since then. So what if we were uh, focusing on building the skill set to build impactful routines? So as a coach, what if I took my eyes and my focus away from the storyboard and I paid attention to my learner, right? As a second coach, why are you looking at the storyboard? Why, as a second coach, are you looking at the storyboard? I want you to think about this a little bit, and we can discuss this a in, a, in a bit. Who is your storyboard? So I want to take you through a little journey. So we're not going to talk about physics, but it, may, it will make sense. So uh, water, right, has three stages, three phases. Ice, right, the liquid and the gas, the solid, the liquid, and the gas. But it's, what is so unique about each phase? So let's dig deeper. If we look at the molecular st uh, structure, right, ice is very structural. 
Think about it as the military, right? Everything is in order. Where world, you know, water is a little bit more loose. And gas, of course, you know, it's molecules flying around. So let's put our thinking, our curiosity in this context. What we want is intentional thinking. We want to act like water, right? And just like Bruce Lee said, right, if you put water in a cup, it takes the shape of a cup. If you put it in a bowl, it takes the shape of a bowl. But it's intentional. So as we're, you know, trying to influence in the thinking, my question to you is if, you know, the solid part is the perfect storyboard that you want to achieve. What is it that you're doing to bring up the intentional curiosity, the water, into your learners, into your first coaches? To be able to develop their thinking so they can achieve all the things that you want them to achieve. How do we get our different departments to work together? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of us here don't have all the support that you want. Right? So finance, um, I can tell you from my experience and my education that they want numbers and you better stick to the budget. Operations doesn't necessarily act so structural, right? Finance is very structural. It's like, a, you know, the solid structure there. But operation is like the middle. They're running around. In there are cases where I've seen even hospitals act like a gas. You know, chicken without heads, right? Running around trying to serve patients and no support whatsoever. So how can we here be the phase transition agent, the bonding between the different phases? So I'm gonna give you an example. Who knows who this guy is? Anybody? His name is Vannevar Bush. Back in the 1940s, he was the director of the NSF, the National Science Foundation, okay? So under President Eisenhower, he was assigned the role of bringing together military and science. So uh, back then, the military was really declining any input from science. Why is that? Because they were lunatics, right? They were crazy people, they were crazy ideas. Yet again, a lot of the ideas that won the war came up from these scientists. His role was to be the phase transition bonding agent. So this is where we come in. Nowadays, we have the same thing happening to us. You have the different departments. You have the different individuals that you're dealing with, and you're trying to bring together the crazy idea that is called kata, or whatever else that you want to call it into be a bonding agent to drive you to develop people so they can better take care of your customers, right? Your shareholders. So how do we do this? And what I've come to learn is the skill and you know the influences we have around us is driving our thinking and our thinking is driving our routines. And that's how we change our behaviors. And we all strive to achieve certain behaviors. So why do we have the tendency of really trying to change people? We have to go back to building the foundation. So you flew over here, most likely. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you for the next two days is um, turn your thinking, your, your, whatever you think you know, into a black, blank uh, canvas. And let your presenters, anything that you learn from your communicating from, with anybody the next two days, really paint the picture of your thinking. So at the end of the week, you can all, me, all show me your thinking. So my question that I have for you is, how are you becoming the face transition agent in your role in your company? It's a very interesting uh, concept that you've got there. I'm curious, um, you had a comment there about um, the, in terms of the influence about how behavior and thinking are connected. And um, yes, <laughs> how um, routines drive behavior um, and how thinking drives routines. 
And I'm just wondering if you've played around or run into the thinking that actually says the other way around. It's actually easier to change behavior and the change in behavior changes the thinking as opposed to this way around. And I wonder if you've played around with that concept at all. That's a great, that's a great question. So um, if it's easier, sometimes does not necessarily mean that um, we're removing the true obstacles. So what I found out at least is that um, we have to struggle, unfortunately, because that's how we, you know, breaking through our barriers, right? Our threshold of knowledge. But if you think about it, let's take this as a, in a, at a personal level, right? Our thinking nowadays, and um, you know, uh, for example, for those of you that might be uh, plant-based uh, folks, is what, right? We have been influenced, right, that uh, plant-based is uh, better, right? Uh, and um, therefore, we're creating a routine. We're only gonna eat plant-based foods and we're gonna shop anything that is non-meat related for whatever reason. And then we try that, you know, that thinking becomes a routine. And then we, you know, uh, we, we tend to de uh, develop a behavior that we say, okay, no more meat, uh, you know, for, you know, because we're environmental friendly or whatever. So while I have not seen it personally the other way around, I've seen a consistent pattern where when we build and we focus on the, good, the influences and the skills to build that thinking up front, and constantly, then we try to, we, we creating impactful routines. And I think this is what we've been missing. And if we have seen boards becoming dormant or uh, initiatives dropping off, is because we don't turn them into impactful routines. Just like a New Year's resolution. They drop off a you know, couple of months after the beginning of the year. I like the word and. I hear it phrased as an or question, and I think it's both. I think there are belief systems that are in our thinking, and you can change those belief systems by changing our behaviors. So to me, I think it's a question that we're looking at from two perspectives, rather than looking at what's really driving it. So I think if we can look at what's the routine drives the behavior, that routine is based off of a belief system. Why do they believe what they do? Why do they act that way? So I agree more with Panos that the routine is around thinking more than behavior, but if you can change the behavior through kata or other methods, you can find a lot of effectiveness in that. So I propose that we think of the term and versus or in the question. That's a great point. Thank you, Panos, and it's nice to meet you. I think we've communicated on LinkedIn, but I'm Bella. Um, I wanted to go back to your question about about ins uh, why people are not as curious as as we would like to be. And obviously, there's a lot in society, starting from when you start kindergarten or maybe before, that drives curiosity um, out of our, out of us or makes curiosity a, an unwelcome behavior. But one of the things that I have just really become conscious of myself is. Um, when you're coaching or managing is your own facial expression, right? So if somebody's coming up with a crazy idea, like you can say all the right things, but if your face says that's a crazy idea, um, they're not gonna come, come out with the next interesting or innovative um, approach, you know, option to try, you know, idea of what the obstacle is that nobody else is seeing, right? And and that's um, um, one of the things that I just think is really hard also as a coach to take care of, right? Because you don't actually know. And I, I actually think the dojo might help with that, right? So you could, you could, somebody could give you feedback on that. Good point. Thank you. Uh, on this slide, where would you put the word habits, if at all? Any thoughts on that? I don't know. What do you guys think? Thinking routines, I'm interpreting is that your yeah. routines in this model are your routine thinking patterns because what the brain is really, all the brain is there to do is control muscles, right? I mean, 
that's the only reason we have a brain. So, um, uh, so that's where habits are, and that's that's perhaps just just kicking out what I think it says. And habits are something that we see from others, maybe. It's observable versus the thinking. So when you say thinking, do you mean you know automatic thinking or conscious thinking? Could be both. Uh -huh. You know, I don't think we have a, too too much of a control of our brain. It controls us, so I think uh, you know we, we're going to experience both. It's just I think we need to know when to filter what. So, so there are habits or neural pathways in our brain, and they drive our behaviors. Um, but the way to change those is to consciously practice a different behavior. So you, you both may be saying the same thing. I think there it's difficult to see where the synonyms are with this slide. That's why I was wondering where habits are. Um, so, deliberately practicing a different routine is a conscious way out of your habits, right? That's right. That's uh, right. It's very uncomfortable. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, when you towel off after the shower, you literally do it the exact same way every time. The thousands of things you every day, you do the same exact way. And then if you try to do it the other way, it feels really wrong. Um, you know, it's hard to change that. But if you deliberately practice it a different way, so I, I think you guys may be on the same page, but it may be semantics, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Panos. <laughs> and next up is Michael, Michael Kasten. Excellent. Just so everybody understands, I'm a consultant, this is a client. And a great client, uh, those of you who are consultants or, or who have done consulting know that your consulting is significantly limited by the quality of your client. And it is, it is, uh, it is my privilege to introduce Pat Geary as a really good client. And we are going to talk about, um, let me back that up, bringing kata into construction. And I want to take just a few minutes, just a few seconds, to sort of set the stage here. Many years ago, there was a film about Michelangelo called Agony and the Ecstasy. And there's a scene in that film where Charlton Heston, playing Michelangelo, is at the top of some very exotic scaffolding, painting the Sistine Chapel. And day after day, the Pope comes in and yells to him, when will it be finished? And his answer always was, when I am done. To some degree, that is uh, an experience that many of us in construction have, in that construction is an outgrowth of the European guilds that many years ago were built around masters and journeymen and apprentices. When they all came ashore in the United States, they immediately brought their tools and went to work and developed a hierarchy within construction projects that for up until very recently, they were operating almost as if they were under a Harry Potter cloak of invisibility where they sort of managed their own work. They told you what it was gonna to take to get the work done there have not been, there's a virtual total absence of process metrics, that is, what is the cycle time on these kinds of things and so on. So bringing kata into construction, um, we, we learned very early on that we first had to um, ensure that there was a much, much better production planning process in place because in many cases, craftsmen would come to work and when you asked them what is your goal for your production goal today, they would say get what we can get. And that was n not uncommon. The quality of the conditions of the project production uh, planning regimen and the uh, crew work assignments were in desperate need of upgrades, as well as the quality of the conditions of the production environment and the crew work zones themselves. We um, 
begin to talk about or begin to realize that we needed to come up with some measure of our planning system and that be, came out of some work from uh, Greg Howell and Glenn Ballard at the Lean Construction Institute, a concept of percent of plan complete. So we started by first of all radically improving the quality of our planning environments and then the planning regimen. So this is what planning on a project used to look like. This is what it looks like now, and all of those post-it notes you see to the left are individual daily production goals. So now at the end of the shift, we can ask, did you get done today what was planned, and if not, why not? And amazingly, as new contractors come aboard to performing subcontractor work, it is one of those questions that oftentimes they find very offensive because nobody has asked them that question. So one of the things that we, I certainly learned from, from the Toyota Way and the, particularly the Toyota Way field book was the concept that you've, you first have to stabilize, then you have to flow, and then you can be work, begin to work on work, uh, uh, creating uh, standardized work and improving the methodology at the work phase. So I will let Pat talk about what our second challenge is and he can fill you in on how it's going on at Story Construction. Thanks, Mike. Um, as Mike alluded to, we've over the last year or so launched into creating a routine for our uh, self-performing crews. We, we do concrete, steel erection, carpentry, as we wanted a routine for them uh, to, to begin the day, to observe the work through the course of the day, and ultimately report on, on their progress through the course, uh, at the end of the day. Um, we've had seven iterations of, of a kata board uh, that incorporates a lot of the, uh, incorporates the, the questions into the board, uh, but, but uses the language of construction. Um, and we have a routine by which we talk to them about what's the ultimate goal we need to accomplish uh, to get the project done. How do they contribute to that is in a way to, to, to create their target condition? What are they, what, where are they at today and what are they supposed to get done today and what are the tools and the materials and the information that they need? Then we have a routine by which we, we have them go out, um, the superintendent or foreman, actually stand and watch the work. Um, take 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon to, to actually observe the work. The, the normal superintendent walks through the work and spends 21 seconds just to see if people are moving. We want us to actually see, we have a routine of questions of what are they seeing, how do we make it safer, um, how, what waste can we improve, what, what process improvements can we make. And then we come at the end of the day and say, what did we observe? Have a discussion with the crew to try to, to try to more routinely and more quickly grow our crew, crew members. They're young people, they're 18, 21 year olds. How do we, how do we en engulf them into understanding why they're doing what they're doing and ultimately getting better? And then we start talking about an experiment we can have for tomorrow. And so we have created this board uh, <clears throat> that our crews go through. Um, it's, a, it's a plan, do, check, reflect uh, a methodology. Um, it's just a dry eraser board that uh, our crews will go up to. So this is a morning meeting. Uh, we have people engage. Uh, and a lot of times we have one board that's in English and one board that's in Spanish. And that's great. Spelling doesn't matter. We want, it's, a, it's the richness of the conversation. We're trying to create a routine by which they're talking about the things that are necessary for them to get their work done, and then understanding why the work happened the way it did, if we got it done like we planned or not, and if not, why not, and how do we make it better tomorrow. Um, we, we will introduce process metrics in another year or two or three. We're simply trying to get a routine by which people are talking about why work are, is happening the way it is. Um, we have just launched into kind of our second round of this. We're doing an experiment on one job site uh, with a different board set up and, and a different um, uh, observation routine. We're getting good results, uh, particularly our young people. They, they kind of thrive on the team, the team collaborative approach. Um, we also have a, a, a new storyboard concept we're using and how we attack just other problems within the organization. Um, we've 
uh, as opposed to having the questions, we simply laid it out within the board routine. So it's all there and people simply answer those questions. Again, these are dry erase marker boards that we use for, for kind of any, any improvement um, activity we may have going on uh, in the different departments or whatever. I want to point out that in the very bottom, in Eight Point Pike, it says concept and, and uh, idea by Mike Rother. <laughs> Let me uh, just share some of the, the, the obstacles. The concept of a craft production model is so totally different from a manufacturing production facility that has been designed by production engineers and, and uh, uh, production managers and equipment that has been designed for the specific uh, production process. There is a clear clash of cultures and languages. And when I say the clash of cultures, it isn't that there are opposing ethnic backgrounds that are having problems. It is the culture of superintendents, that is project, the guys that are ultimately responsible for the project have grown up being rewarded for being sort of high noon gunfighters where they the quick draw artists where they solve problems on the fly and go to the next problem. Uh, to begin to routinely expect them to comfortably coach a foreman into how to better observe their work is amazingly difficult to cause these guys to get out of habits that many of them have had for 30 to 35 years. There is little if any concept of a focus on process metrics. Early in my career, we did a research project with 120 construction operations that were one grunt food, two grunt water, simple kind of stuff. I mean, we weren't talking about putting process piping in a nuclear reactor containment facility. We were putting in storm drain going across an open field. And we routinely found that the delta between what we could accomplish when we got all of the all of the obstacles and variability out of construction crew operations compared to what the estimate had been was a, a delta of 4.29 to 1. That is, if we estimated we could, they were going to get 80 feet of storm drain, we could get 320 if we just organized the operation. So we know that the when and if and when we get to process metrics that there's huge undiscovered potential that we simply haven't been able to get to because we have not been able to see it. The uh, projects and crews are scattered all across Iowa in, in Pat's case. In an earlier client, they were scattered all over five states on the eastern seaboard. And it is very difficult to get to those numbers of places, particularly as every day in a crew's life oftentimes is in a different work zone doing a different task. And last, the, the totally uh, new routine vernacular and major um, role changes, the vernacular in and of itself. I mean, just the concept of what is your, what is the direction we're trying to go? That is, what is our challenge? What is your current condition? What is a, a, your next target condition? And what obstacles are keeping you from it? That vernacular in itself can uh, cause very accomplished project superintendents to virtually lock up because it seems so out of character to what they've been used to be doing. You want to talk to the progress to date? Yeah, so we, we're pleased with what we've seen happen so far. Um, our craftspeople, particularly uh, our younger ones, um, have, have kind of rallied to, uh, the, to the boards. They, they enjoy the conversation. Uh, they, they brought us good ideas. They're helping us get the boards uh, to be better and the routines be better. Um, we, got, we got routines established and, and happening typically. Um, where our, um, we learned that our foremen and our superintendents um, changing their habits is really where the challenge is. They're, they're, the, um, uh, they're the learners, our, our foremen are the learners, our superintendents are coaches, and, and changing the behaviors. Similar to the things that we heard earlier in these presentations are, are exactly what we're facing. And um, so we're looking for help. Um, we're looking for advice. Uh, we've heard so far today has been great. We're looking for that over the next couple of days because it's, um, we're learning things every day. Our, our knowledge, the threshold of knowledge sits about right here and 
and anything you guys can help us would be would be great. So, thanks. Okay. If it's not too much to share, I would love to know what drove you to this idea of employing Bacata and what improvements have you seen so far that are driving you to continue? Um, so we started this journey um, about six and a half years ago. Um, it really boiled, that boiled down to, I would go to our sites every day and I would just hear our people who'd been in the business 25 and 30 years and said, this isn't fun anymore. Um, and if it doesn't change, I'm gonna be done. And th th they're builders, that's who they are. And so we had to find something that changed the way their day went. And so we started to make the, tried to work to make the projects more predictable and consistent to where they can count on some things. That was kind of the first picture of the, of the, po the post-it notes. We knew we could get to the cruise. 25 years ago, Mike worked with us, and we could make our cruise go really fast and have fun, but it, it was never stable because the jobs weren't stable, so we started there. We wanted to work now to make the, the lives of our crews better. Um, we're doing this to improve the lives of our people. Um, this isn't about financial stuff. That stuff takes care of itself. It's just about ha our, our people having a good day every day. That's our slogan. I want everybody to have a good day every day, and we're gonna do whatever is necessary to get there, and we need to get a little bit better every day, and this has been the thing we've been able to stay with that's had the biggest impact um, of the things we've tried over, over 30 years. Uh, hi guys, I'm Joachim, I'm from Sweden. Uh, thanks for sharing about construction, which is a difficult business to be in. Uh, just wanna share a bit, uh, I've been working with a company doing um, elements for houses, so it's a bit of a more controlled. Uh, but we introduced the the concept of tact, tact time, uh, which was interesting. When you have 35 crew members with hammers, and you say we're going to introduce tact, which was perfect in a Kata sentence because they all shouted, "It's never going to work." I was seeing hammers coming, flying. Uh, and the reply from me was, I know it's not going to work. That's why we're testing it. <laughs> and 35 guys go, makes sense, actually. Uh, and they've gone from tax from anything from 75 minutes to 100 minutes because the, the product is so complex. But we got rid of all the things that varied around the, the product. So now we're down at 29 minutes, 29 minutes. Uh, and it's not the product that, that is causing a lot of problems. So ju just by using tact as a method of getting obstacles out uh, as a concept, just a tip for you. Thanks. Thank you. As you spoke about the obstacle of vernacular, uh, I saw some knowing nods around the room. I wondered if uh, you might uh, just explain a bit of what accommodation, if any, you made for that in construction? Yeah, so um, <coughs> uh, we've introduced all of the, the kind of vernacular, but we've also kind of given them the language that is in construction that they know. Um, milestones is our big, our big chunks of work that we need to accomplish on our projects. Those are our challenges. Um, the, our target conditions that oftentimes what, what that crew needs to accomplish within that big chunk of work uh, so the next crews can move on and, and ultimately uh, um, complete that. So we've we tried to weave in as qu closely as we can um, similar kind of language that's accomplishing the same thing. And it's almost about we're gonna employ the strategy without being as completely overt with it, uh, but, but build a routine um, Tell them and, and teach them, but uh, but not hit them over the head with a sledgehammer with the language and have that be the impediment. So, uh, are the uh, craftsmen union or non-union, and what are some of the challenges that you've faced if they are union? Uh, our craftsmen are not. Um, 
However, we have um, union crafts on our jobs every day. Um, and we haven't employed the, the daily routine with the other subcontractor crafts, but I'll tell you, uh, in stabilizing the projects, it, we made the projects better for everybody, and it, it didn't make any difference whether a craft was union or not. Um, we're, we were there to make everybody to have a good day, and it was, people didn't argue with that, and um, so we don't really care, and it, it, we haven't seen particular uh, it, harder or easier with, with one type of setup or the other. Let me, let me take it. Over the years, I've probably done three to 4,000 methods, what, what in lean or in the Toyota production system might be called Kaizen events with tradesmen. Uh, well over 50% of those were union uh, craftsmen. And I, the thing that I've found is that, I mean, of all of those, I never had one crew spit the bit. They, they all were engaged and excited about doing it. And the wonderful thing about craftsmen that, that, I mean, one of the reasons I love construction is they love to figure things out. And if you can help them see their work in a different light, they are eager to figure out how to do it better. And, and I have seen no impact on union affiliations that affect that negatively. Yeah, um, Tyson Heaton. I'm just I'm interested if you've if you've brought your client into any of that or what the clients if the clients had exposure to to your scheduling boards and your huddles and what their what their reaction is. Um, yeah, it's the only thing we market. Uh, we have taken, uh, we don't, we bring them to our trailers and say, this is what we do. And it's a lot simpler for people to understand. Who, most of the clients we build for don't build a lot. Uh, they build once every three or four or five or 10 years. Um, and so uh, we brought this into every facet of our business, our estimating, our design, our accounting, safety. Um, you, we you see boards like that. How are we planning our days? How are we planning our weeks and our months? But it, our clients, they get it. Anybody who has any lean kind of concept gets it real quick. And um, if they don't, we don't really want to work for them. And, and that's okay. Um, there's other people who can serve them in, an, in a different way. So yeah, it's, it's really the only thing, it's, it's all we market. Can I just follow up with a piece? Have you seen your competition be interested in any of these methods or they just kind of ignore what you're doing? Well, Lean Last Planner is out there, and it's, and it's similar but different. Um, but we'll teach anybody who wants to hear it. Our goal is to make the industry better. Because if, if other general contractors, other subcontractors are suffering, the community is small enough that we will, we will suffer as a result because there's a lack of manpower, and that manpower has to go to deal with those issues. So we, we're happy to teach anybody who wants to see it. Competitors, it um, doesn't matter. Um, quite frankly, if they can come in and we can give them an hour speech and they can do it, more power to them because it's taken us seven years and we're still figuring lots and lots of stuff out. That, that's really cool. Very inspiring work. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yep. Um, there's a uh, just a real thoughtfulness and a humility to what you're saying. I really appreciate it. Um, you touched just a little bit in passing on um, metrics and just measuring a few things and I'm just really curious, uh, how much are you using, like, after-the-fact things, uh, on time, what, whatever, versus leading things, where you actually can close the door before the horse goes out of the barn? And where are you on that journey, if you don't mind speaking to that? Excellent um, question. So um, the, the, the principal measurement we've used on our sites is PPC, or Plan Percent Complete. So we're trying to measure the, the quality of our planning. Um, our crews will look at it as did they, uh, how hard did they work? And we've, we've had to change that mindset. Um, we want to, um, I think somebody said it earlier, supervisors and leaders are the reason uh, that things fail. Uh, or that th um, we set our craftspeople up to, to fail every day and we want to blame them. And so we want to change the, the, uh, the way we talk about the, our work to understand how did we fail them. We send our people out into the, in the field 10% of the time without the materials they need to complete their work. And then we blame them because they didn't get it done. Well, we set that up. And so how can we measure the quality of our planning? Because if we do that, our people will have good days. And so that's been our primary metric. Um, we're now getting into looking at some behavior kind of things. 
um, shingle kinds of things? What are the behaviors we need that are ultimately going to get uh, kind of the outputs we're looking for? Uh, but we're early in that. I mean, we're, we're still kind of discovering. If you, if you want to see a discouraged bunch, begin to, begin to explain to a group of craftsmen that there are three types of effort that is value adding, non-value adding, but necessary and waste. When, when, when they begin to hear somebody say that what they're doing has fundamentally been waste all day long, that is, uh, that I won't go very far. So, but, but we, there are a couple places where we've begun to talk about what does our value added work pie chart look like and what can we do to begin to massage that. But the, prob the, the difficulty with process metrics in construction is there is no easy means of collecting that. That means somebody has to be there observing. And if I learned anything early on, it was if you go out and stand in the midst of a crew doing work and watch them for 15 minutes, somebody will come up and ask you, is there something wrong? Why are you here? Why are you watching us? And so that's... That is a, a serious diff. I mean, the, the cost of creating process metrics within construction means that you have to have people there actually measuring it. We, we eventually, I mean, early on in my career, we started using time-lapse photography to, catch, to capture that so that we could then do the analysis after the fact. I had a question, if you could elaborate a little bit on the, you mentioned Lean Last Planner and and if you, as far as like how do you use it, do you use that in conjunction with Kata or separately from Kata or just sort of explain that? Yeah, Michael, go back to the boards. Um, so they're, um, they're uh, the last planner system or the board system that we use um, kind of sets the foundational um, flow for the project. So we that what we want to do is be fairly predictive that we can consistently get one day's worth of work done every day. So that's creating that platform or, or that level of predictability. We then go to, let's have a discussion up with our crews about exactly what the individual men are gonna do, uh, what each craftsperson is gonna do through the course of that day to get that bundle of work done. And so the board you see on, 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 on the screen the extreme right side is the, is the overall project schedule. So the end of the project is at the extreme right. Extreme left is what people are going to do on an individual daily basis. And so we work, we do our planning, we have routines, we, we, we basically, it's like a rock crusher. We crush the, the size of the chunk of the work down as we move left down the board to a, a small piece of in, one day's worth of work. And then in this trailer, back on the, on the opposite wall is the other boards where people then talk about how, what are we going to do through the course of the day, maybe hour by hour, but what are we going to do ultimately as individuals to get that work done? So they do work in conjunction, but the, this board is first to be able to allow it to be predictable for our people when they go out to do the work in the field. And those are now, those are now a trailer like this, what, what, what I refer to as the production control center, is now on every one of their projects. I mean, it's exactly the same layout. Okay, thank you, Michael, Pat. Okay, and uh, cleaning up for us here, Sylvain Landry, please welcome Sylvain. Hi there, um, so I'm from Canada, from Quebec. Uh, thus uh, the strange uh, or funny accent. Um, so, um, this, is, uh, this is Catacon. So, um, let's do an experiment. Okay, so I'm going to show um, words uh, on the screens and you have to name the color of those words, but you have to do it 
all together. Okay, so this is the challenge, quote uh, unquote. Uh, so you must not read the word, but say out loud, name the color of those words. Uh, and the colors are, are basic four colors, uh, so black, blue, red, or green. So there's no light blue, uh, navy blue, uh, forest green, or whatever, okay? So those basic four uh, colors. And again, you have to do it all together. Um, if, by the way, you are colorblind, please do lip sync. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you're uh, ready? Okay. Um, next time I click, if it all goes well, um, the slides will change automatically. I arrived late, so we weren't able to test it. And it will go a little bit faster and faster, okay? So you have to keep uh, concentrated. So again, name the color of the words. You were pretty good. You were pretty good. Um, so it, it's just a fun, uh, a, a fun example to um, um, talk about system one and system two. And some of you are very familiar with those two speed of thoughts. And um, system one uh, is the one responsible for having us jump to conclusion. And we're trying. Uh, to train kind of uh, the system one through CATA. So I won't go in, into that, but I, I just wanted to share one way to, to bring this up to a, a large group of, of people. And it's a funny way to uh, introduce um, any teaching, quote unquote, on uh, Toyota CATA. And those geek meetup could be an occasion to share some of our examples we use while teaching. Talking about teaching, um, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, a website as well, um, uh, the uh, Toyota Kata at University uh, website that is hosted by HEC Montreal. So I'm a business school professor teaching at HEC Montreal in Montreal. Uh, so I wanted to share that information so you can look it up. Um, everything is um, downloaded, available, you can use uh, the material. Basically, we ask professors, university professors or lecturers, people teaching CATA, to share material on this uh, website. Uh, this website, you can Google it or find it on Mike's uh, website as well, Toyota CATA at University. Uh, so basically, uh, you, as an example, find information on, uh, uh, on case studies. And this is something we just added uh, a, a week ago. Uh, so there's two new case studies published uh, on NEA Baptist, their journey uh, implementing the management system and emphasizing Toyota Kata as well. So uh, you can click on those links. These links will bring you to Harvard Business School uh, Publishing where you can uh, purchase those uh, case studies. Uh, everything else is uh, can, it can be downloaded uh, for free. So uh, information about students' uh, projects on Toyota Kata. You have uh, Marc Olivier's La Gentille uh, thesis, master thesis. You have uh, William Harvey, Harvey's uh, PhD thesis. You can uh, get through this uh, website. And you have information. You have tab per professor, and you can get uh, information. Um, they, uh, they, uh, they allowed you to share like Jeff Liker's syllabus on his uh, Lean Toyota Kata class at the University of Michigan and uh, of course Mike's uh, some of his uh, material and a bunch of other professors and this, is a, this, this website is about one year old and it, it's growing so um, 
take a look, uh, pass the information around if you know professors that are uh, teaching or that are curious about Toyota Kata. Uh, ask them, look this up, and ask them share their, uh, their material. Thank you. Any comments, questions for Sylvain? No, it, it, the, uh, basically it's in several languages, so uh, most of the material is in English. Uh, most of the professors uh, are from the U.S. or uh, England, for instance, uh, but uh, you have material in German and in Spanish and French, and so it's, uh, we, we share the, the material uh, as it comes. Basically, I saw some pretty awesome pictures of a kata practitioner day you had. Uh, do you want to talk uh, for a minute about that? How many have you done so far, and how's it going? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Michael, for, for the question. So at our school, we ran the second Cata Practitioner Day last uh, uh, November. Um, so basically, it was a half-day uh, uh, experiment, kind of, uh, in the afternoon. Um, so basically, we uh, were able to uh, draw about close to 250 uh, participants. Uh, so basically, we had the presentations. I introduced CATA and uh, tied it up, uh, tied it up uh, with uh, organization learning in 20 minutes. Then we had Brad Parsons from NEA uh, Baptist that uh, did the presentation uh, of about an hour. Uh, then the, uh, a presentation from uh, uh, the folks that uh, wrote the uh, Toyota Marie Jogger uh, with uh, Tilo, we had uh, Jean-Marc and Mac Mark Olivier talk about the art of uh, um, asking uh, questions. So we, have, we had a bunch of presentations. Most of them were 30-minute uh, presentations. And at the end, we had short 10-minute uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so this was about the setup uh, with the networking uh, cocktail. And during the break at... Um, in, in the, the afternoon, we had a 30-minute break because we were 250. Um, and uh, basically, uh, during the break, we ended out cards uh, while, uh, to people while uh, registering. And they had to uh, exchange cards to get uh, examples of uh, deepening uh, questions. So we, we tried to uh, make it fun as well and uh, emphasize the networking uh, aspect. Um, this half day was, if we go into some uh, details, this uh, half day was advertised through mailing lists and social uh, medias. It cost about 100 uh, US to, uh, to attend, and it was held in our auditorium. So it was a basic presentation-like uh, event, uh, half day kind of uh, conference. Okay, thank you very much, Sylvain. Thank you. Okay, well, that takes us to the end of our time. Uh, we're going to do the group photo, actually not in here. There is too many people, so we're going to go out into the lobby here and uh, do a group photo. So come on out. <laughs>